Is it working, Hannah? All right, good morning, Open Door Bible Baptist Church. Go ahead and stand with me. We'll begin our Sunday school song this morning. My sins are gone. Topic for our lesson today, 12 men went to spy. Some saw grapes on clusters. Oh, all together now. Some saw God was over all, and ten were bad, and two were good. Whoa, that was fun. There we go. We'll sing our next song. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? Grab your Bibles, grab it with both hands and hold it firmly, and then open it 
to the book of Numbers. We're going to start, we're going to have two passages today, a little complicated. They're actually the same story, but uh, so for those of you that are all the way up to expert level, I'm going to need you to go to Numbers chapter 13 and Deuteronomy, Deut, Deuteronomy chapter 1. All right. I will meet you there in a small moment. As soon as I get this set up. Corrected? All right, perfect. So before we get into our lesson, as many of you know, my little baby daughter was born, and so I thought I'd show you a few pictures. Her name is Evangeline Marie, and she was born on June 24th, 8 pounds, 3 ounces, 21 inches long. A beautiful little girl. Mommy and baby are doing well, and she's doing really good. There you go. So you can ask later for more pictures. I'm very excited about it. So, All right. So, back to numbers. Now that we've given the people what they wanted, now we'll get back to numbers. Before we get to numbers, this is our habit sometimes, beginning in the 1830s and ending in 1869 when the railroad came all the way out, this is a painter's depiction of what became called the Oregon Trail. Maybe homeschoolers would remember playing an Oregon Trail video game, where usually you died of disease if you weren't good at the game. But there's a lot of times you like to think about, uh, you know, there's like one trail leading rest. There's actually a bunch of trails that, that went all over the place. And between the 1830s and 1869, over 400,000 American pioneers, they traveled west to the Pacific. They went over the plains, and they went over the Rockies, and over the Sierra Nevadas, and this overland route was called the Oregon Trail, and then there's the California Trail, and then there's a bunch of different cutoffs and a bunch of different routes all the way through. And no matter which way you go, it's about 2,000 miles long. 2,000 miles long. And it took four to six months of slow, painful walking beside your wagons, slowly walking all the way to California to get to the promised land that they called it. Nowadays, we call it California, and it's not, not anymore. No one wants to go there. Everyone's actually coming back. It's a good thing. But they made their way all the way through. And I've got a couple more pictures for you here. There's one here, and then here you go. This is more of a modern map. As you can kind of see, the trails started in Missouri and uh, through Missouri and Kansas, the trails kind of all, if you can see this mouse here, let's take it over. Oh, where is it? We're trying to get over there. Give me a second. Is it going to show up? Well, it's not going to work. We're just going to have to point today. So you can kind of see the trails kind of stay together in the middle. That was the main trails. And then once they get into Wyoming, they kind of split out and go to all the way up and down the coast. And now what's shown here are the main routes. But actually what it was more like, it wasn't like, you know, a modern highway where there's, you know, exits here and you can get off and, and stop at the toll plaza and get yourself some Starbucks coffee on the way. Really, it was just a series of landmarks that were written down in manuals that certain wagon leaders knew about and people who had been across the trail would make money leading more wagon tra trails. And the other thing was it was like little things nailed to trees and, and just a series of ruts. Because as, you know, 400,000 people are going across it every year, then those wagon trails would make just ruts. And you would see that sometimes the distance wide, over 100 miles. So you see that red line? When it gets through Wyoming, you see, like, there's 100 miles from here to there of just ruts going everywhere of people saying, well, you know what? It looks a little easier over this direction, and I think I'm going to try here. And so instead of it being, like, this official, like, Oregon Trail that everyone had to stay on. It was like, hey, you're off the trail. It was more like people started in Missouri, and they were like, we want to get to California, and everyone's just like, hey, I've got a different way. I've looked at the map. Let's cut off this corner, and we'll save 300 miles. Turns out it was desert, and they died. And so people would go across, and if you were lucky and things went well, you would make it to the other side. And sometimes people would follow a different route, and... They're still there. They didn't make it. 
That was the reality of traveling. Now, who's been hiking for more than 15 minutes? Please raise your hand. Hiking for more than 15 minutes. 30 minutes. Do we have any 30 minutes? Two hours. Two hours? Do we have a full day of hiking and staying in the wilderness, not coming back? A full night. I've done it like once, but we drove most of the way. I've done some hiking for fun, but most of the time, so you hike and you come back to base camp at the end of the day. Carrying all your belongings with you on wagons or on your back, that's a whole different story. And, and even now, it's like, okay, I'm out here, I make a mistake, this guy said I know the way, it turns out he's an idiot, has no idea where he's going, and now we're without water and it's been three days. It's like, okay, let's pull out the walkie-talkies, let's pull out the satellite phones, and they're coming to get me with choppers. I'm going to be carried out, it's going to be fine. Here's the problem. The people of Israel, it's really difficult for us to imagine the world that they live in. So we need to forget about National Guard, park rangers. We need to forget about all the people that when we think about, you know, if I break my ankle because this cliff is really steep and I probably shouldn't be climbing it, if this happens to me, someone's going to come and save me. No one was going to come and save them. Moses came and he showed them the mighty power of God and he said, follow me, I'm taking you to a wonderful place. And God was leading them and he was showing them who he was. And yet, if they were wrong, if Moses was just a crazy man, they were going to die and no one was going to save them. We need to think about that. We need to understand the world in which they live where they're literally walking in the desert places and sometimes they had nicer trails and sometimes the trails that the people of Israel were walking on, so we're now to the people of Israel, sometimes those trails were very, very difficult and they were walking for months covering hundreds and hundreds of miles. And just like the Oregon Trail people, if their wagon leader was wrong, then they would die a slow and painful death. And if Moses was wrong, then the people were going to die a slow, painful death. And they were very much aware of that. And before, they ran out of water. And they're like, Moses, you're trying to kill us. And Moses says, no, God wants to show you that he can bring water out of rocks. He wants to show you that when you come to water that you can't drink, he can fix it. God is, wants to take care of you. He's going to bring bread from heaven. But if God hadn't been doing that, they would have died. They would not have survived. And they had, they had a choice here. And that's the choice that they have continually as they're in the wilderness to look at the world, to see the world as it was, a place that would kill them if not for the provision of God, or to follow and believe the promises of God. So, as we looked at last week, we had our breakup of the book of, book of Numbers. We have that first part. They're camped in Sinai, and they're getting laws, and they're numbering the people, and then they travel, and while they're traveling... What happens when they travel? Anybody please raise your hand? I will pick you if you don't raise your hand. Mr. Povey, does he know? Do you know Mr. Povey? That's very good. Uh, Rudy, I'm going to pick on you. What happened when they traveled? Were you not here last week? <sighs> See, I'm not very good at picking. Uh, Miss Pam, I know you were here last week. <coughs> what did you say? I can't quite hear you. You were greeting? Ah, no one was here last week. Wow, this is discouraging. It's okay. Miss Lauren in the back. There we go, murmuring and complaining. Every time they travel, and they're kind of camped, and they go to a different place, they're like, this road is really long. We're all going to die. Why aren't we there yet? Moses, you're really bad. We need a new leader. Miriam and, Andrew and Aaron were like, Hey, we can do this Moses thing too. God's spoken to us, and God's like, not like I do to Moses. Be quiet. And they were like, we're really sorry. Please don't kill us. And everyone had to wait. And now they get to Kadesh Barnea. And then for the rest of the book, they're going to travel again, more complaining and all that. So now we get to our lesson today, 12 spies in Canaan, also known as 12 angry men, or mission impossible. Valerie made this for us, so we should all thank her when she gets back. I thought it was really cool, so there we go. There we go. We can watch it again just for fun. There we go. Mission Impossible. <laughs> so 
they get to Kadesh Barnea, and they're there. And let's look at Numbers chapter 13 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel of every tribe of their fathers. Shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them? And Moses, by commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, and all those men were heads of the children of Israel. And these were their names. And we get some more names. And we will not read through all of that because it's going to be a little difficult. But you guys can do that on your own. Go now to Deuteronomy in chapter 1. Look at verse 20. So they came to Kadesh Barnea. Right, that's where we're at. And as I said unto you, ye are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give to us. This is Moses speaking. So he's speaking to the people, and he's telling them, remember what I said to you when we were in Kadesh Barnea. So these two together give us the whole story. So they're there at Kadesh Barnea, and before God gives the command, this is what happens. You are come to the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give us. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of every tribe. So this was their idea. They were like, Moses, like, we're here. Let's go up and possess the land that God promised to us, that God promised to Abraham all the way back then. And they were like, hey, let's send out some spies. And Moses is like, this is a great idea. And God says, send out men who are rulers. And so they send out the 12 men on a secret mission to go into the land of Israel, the land that God had promised them. And as they go, they go to a place called Eshkol. That's what it's called. And they, Moses tells them in the next couple of verses, I need you to go southward. I need you to go up. I need you to look at the hill country. I need you to look everywhere and see the people. Are they strong? Are they well prepared? Where do they live? What does the land look back? And bring us report. And you guys go that way. And all the rest of us are going to go this way. And we'll meet back at this place in 40 days. You have to meet the pickup or it's all going to be over. There wasn't that kind of tension, but it's fun to imagine. So they're going to meet back. So they're going to go. 12 guys. They're the leaders of each people. Each one is a representative. And here's the thing that I learned as I read this. Guess what Eshkol is? Eshkol is like this valley still to this day. They produce all these grapes. And when we think of Eshkol, it's like these massive cluster of grapes that they put on a pole and it was so big it took two men to carry it. I don't know if this is exactly how it was. It could be that maybe it was more like a big box to keep it from falling off. Or maybe they were just eating it on the way. That'd be great. If you're the guy in the back, if you're the guy in the front, you know, it's kind of hard. Um, and, but in the land of Israel, Eshkol is known as Hebron. Hebron was the place that David would eventually live and be the king of before he moved to Jerusalem. But here's what's even cooler. God promised to Abraham that he would bring him uh, many people. He had no sons. He couldn't have sons. It was impossible. And God said, one day, you're going to have so many children, nobody can count them. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to own this right here. And when the 12 spies get there, they got to Eshkol. They got to the place where God very first time told Abraham, you, this is you. You're going to be these people, and you're going to be this nation, and I'm going to bless everybody through you. And they're there. Everything happened like God said that it would happen. And the 12 spies are there. Like, it's like going to to like uh, maybe in our country, we think of going to Washington, D.C., or maybe even to like Philadelphia, and you can see the Liberty Bell, and you can be in the very place that George Washington and the signers signed the Constitution, and you can kind of like sense that it's like this is like holy ground, like something amazing back in history happened here. And even like going to a battlefield like Gettysburg, when I go there and you walk through the fields, you can like hear the voices of the men who died there. Like, Something historic happened here. And the men, these 12 men, they were sent on a mission. Go see the land. And they got to the place. 
And they were the people. God said, you're going to be here. And they were the 12 spies. They were his representatives. And they were there where God had said, you guys are going to exist. You're going to come into being. And you're going to live here. And I'm going to give it to you. Wow. That's crazy to me when you think about that. And there were 12 spies, though. And they got back. And they got to the people. Here's them picking, and here's them being at Kadesh Barnea, and here's them bringing it all back. And then they gave their report. And I've been to journeys with people, and like I talked about, you have that kind of idea of seeing what happened there once, seeing the reality of it. And I can see it, I'm so excited about it. And got to go to see a battlefield up in Canada, and we were with another family, and I'd read about the battlefield on the Plains of Abraham for my whole life, and I was so excited about it, and I was like, this is where they came up and, and they attacked the French. Wow! And the other family was like, you know, this is really cool to go to places and, and then go home and read about it later. I was like, how can you not get it? You have no idea what you're seeing. They didn't get it. They didn't get what they're seeing. And as we sing about this morning, 10 of those spies were good. My bad. Let's start that again. <laughs> Strike that. Reverse it. Thank you. 10 of the spies were bad, like really bad. They didn't get it. Only two guys, Joshua and Caleb. And when we remember, there, we know there's 12 spies, but who knows the names of the spies? I know Joshua, and I know Caleb. I don't know any other guys, because we just know they were bad. And that's the reality of it. We never, you don't remember the bad people. You don't remember their names. You just remember the evil that they did. That's what lives on. And they didn't get it. And listen to what they said. Beginning in verse 26. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought them back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So they showed them all the stuff. Secret agents, give us your mission. Report. They give their after briefing. So like, Agent Moses, here's what we found. Um, and they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Now, here's something to remember. Every time before this that you see the land float with, with milk and honey, it has some sort of statement this is the land that God swear, that God promised to give to Abraham. The land that's abundant, that's the land that's promised. The land that's abundant, that's the place that we're going. And all they say is, the land of milk and honey. They just say, hey, it was good. It was really good. Have you ever been given someone, your teacher comes, or your boss, and they're like, hey, you're doing really good at this. We really like that you're so friendly, and we really like that you're doing a great job, but disjunctive. I'm going to tell you that things are really good because I'm about to tell you I don't like you. I'm about to tell you something really bad. And they say, hey, it flows with milk and honey. And they don't say, they avoid the idea that God promised it. They say, but the people there are strong. They are strong. Look at verse 28. And dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Now, Anak. This was a family of people that were giants, like huge. They said they were like giants. The giants were there, strong-walled cities, very strong people. And by strong, it's not just that they had huge, bulging biceps. It was more that there was a lot of people, and they were well-prepared to fight. They were impossible to overcome. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites, they dwell, all these different people. It's not just the Hittites, it's the Amorites and the Jebusites and the Hivites. All of them are there. And then the Canaanites that dwell by the sea and the coast of Jordan, we're listing off all these people and the list is really long. There's a lot of enemies. They're well prepared. They're strong and they have giants, people we can't fight with. This is the problem. This is the problem. This is what they're saying. Everything is great, just like God said it was. But God didn't actually promise this to us, and we can't do it. And Caleb, he gets up, and he stills the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. 
Because it's where they start arguing. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land which we have gone up to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, the people we just talked about. I need to expand on this point, they say. They're giants. And we were like grasshoppers in their sights. And that's what they thought of us. It's not just when when the way that they're talking about this, they're not just describing them as like really tall NBA players. It's like, The NBA superstars are there. It's LeBron James. No, they're describing them as superhuman, as in descendants with superhuman powers. They're saying they're so big, they must come from, they're not human. There's no way we can fight them. This is not possible. When you go there, that place, it eats people. If you try to go in there, it eats the inhabitants. We can't go there. And here's how the people responded. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. We've heard this before. These are a bunch of crybabies. And they lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation. And they said, Would God, we had died in Egypt. God was delivering them from their slavery. They were going to die. It wasn't just that, like, hey, we want to keep these people alive because we want to build big cities. It's like, let's build big cities so we can kill these people. Let's bury them in the cities that they're building. We want them to die. That's the whole point. They weren't just slaves. It was concentration camps. They were trying to extinguish all of the people of Israel. And God said, I have a special purpose for you. I'm setting you free so you can serve me. They're supposed to be the people that were set free to serve God. But instead, instead, they want to be slaves again. Now, remember how we talked about the Oregon Trail and all of that? It was difficult to go into the land. The people of Canaan were strong. They were well prepared. The way had been difficult. And if Moses was wrong, then they were going to die. So we got to live in the world that they were in. We can't just be like, sometimes when we read the Bible stories, we're just like, Moses, don't do that. People of Israel, just believe God. And then we go about our day and we do the exact same thing. We have to remember the difficulties to see where they were at, but they were faced with a choice. To choose to believe their fears or believe the God that had brought them out of Egypt. He had done mighty works, but instead they believed their fears and they believed the evil report of those 10 spies. And they wept all night, and they murmured against Moses, and they wished for death. And they said, we're going to get us a new captain. Moses has no idea what he's doing. He's brought us out of Egypt, and now we're going to die. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get us a new captain, and he's going to take us all the way back, and then we're going to survive. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to go back. Just, they've been traveling for months. This is the land that they believed in, and they got there, and they've lost their belief that it could be good, that God is trying. These people are in anguish of soul. We ought to feel bad for them, not condemn them. They've lost the belief that God is trying to be good to them and that God is trying to save them. And they wished for death. Oh, that we had died on the way. If we hadn't got to this point, it would have been so better. And Moses and Aaron, verse 5, fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And then we have the two good guys of the story. The the, The four good guys, Moses and Aaron, and the two good spies, Joshua and Caleb. And they go through the crowd, and Joshua and Caleb are preaching to the people. And they're saying, hey guys, don't cry. God can take care of us. Miss Pam, we can make it. We can go in. And they're running around, and they're saying, it's going to be okay. You don't have to be scared. Yeah, they're strong. But do you remember the Red Sea? Do you remember it? Do you remember how God brought us through that? Do you remember how crazy it was? And they're running through the crowds. And Moses and Aaron, they rip their coats. And I like this suit, so I'm not going to do that. But... And it's a lot harder to get those in those days than is now. This was like emptying your bank account and throwing it all away, just throwing money into the air. 
they're destroying their clothes and they fall on their face before God. And Joshua and Caleb are saying, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't look at verse 9. So let's go back to verse 8. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. It's two different views. One says, the land is going to eat us up. And Joshua and Caleb said, they're food. We're going to devour them. They are something that God is going to feed to us. We can do this. God will delight in us if we only don't rebel. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. So as they're trying to convince them, do right. Believe in God. I've been there. I've seen it. This is what God wants for you. And they're like, let's kill them. Let's kill them too. We give up. We're going back. I just wish we had died. I wish we'd never been here. I wish I'd never been born. God's trying to kill us. And the glory of the Lord appeared before the tabernacle. In the middle of all this craziness, God shows up. And the Lord sent into Moses. Moses and Aaron are here in the front, and they're praying to God on their faces. And God shows up. And the Lord sent into Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed them? And God says, I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. God says, I promised to Abraham, Moses the son of Abraham, these people refuse to believe me. I brought you, Moses. I gave you all those signs. I did the ten plagues. I brought them and I've made them water from rocks. I've healed their water. I've given them food every day. I've provided from all those ways. It's over. They refuse to believe in me. I cannot force them to do that. I'm going to destroy them all. And Moses, I'm going to make of you a new nation. We're going to start again. Remember, how many of you have ever been like in charge of something and everyone was like, we don't like you anymore. We're making a new leader. And then the guy, the big boss comes and he's like, hey, we can lay all these people off. We're just going to get rid of them and start again with you because you've done right. If that's me, I'm like, let's do it. These people rejected you. They've rejected me. We're just trying to get the job done. We're trying to go into the land, and they've refused me, and they've refused you. They're done. But Moses, just like he did on Mount Sinai, he comes back to God, and he intercedes for the people. And in very much of the same language, he says, God, this is who you are. Think of your reputation. It's going to be told all throughout that the people did not, that you brought them out here and you killed them. People are going to know about that. And they're going to say that you weren't able to do this. Moses intercedes for the people, and he reminds God of his character, God's own character. And this blows my mind to think about that, that Moses is able to talk to God in this way, but this is the position that Moses has as an intercessor for the people. They needed someone to plead their cause. Just like in our day, Jesus Christ pleads our cause. And God is not changed by Moses. Moses is the one who is changed here. And the people are the ones who are delivered. And it's to show for us even to see this is the character of God. God says, I'm going to give you this opportunity. Moses says, no, I want you to be who you are. And God says, that's exactly who I am. But here's what I'm going to do. They had lost their opportunity. And the Lord said, verse 20, chapter 14, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, if have not hearkened unto my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein to he went, and his seed shall possess it. So Caleb and Joshua, they're going to get to go in. But everyone else, they've refused to believe. Ten times God has given them ten different opportunities, and they've tempted God ten different times, refusing to believe, and God says, it's done. You guys are not going in. You're going to die in the wilderness. And your children, which you said, oh, our children are going to die. We're trying to protect our children. How many times have we heard that? Every time that people are scared 
and they accuse God of doing things and they accuse other people, they say, we're trying to protect our children. <sighs> and really, they're about themselves. They use their children as an excuse. And God says, those children you're using as an excuse, they're going to possess the land because they're going to believe me because they're going to watch you die refusing to believe. Next 40 years. It took you 40 days to look at the land and disbelieve. I'm going to give you 40 days, rather. 40 years, you're going to wander in the wilderness. And every day, you're going to have to tell your sons, God meant to take us into the promised land, but I'm going to die because I refuse to believe. So don't you dare do that. And you would have to teach your children, I messed up, and that's why we're in the wilderness, hungry and alone. This is my fault. You should believe God. And the people, and then the ten, ten spies that were bad, you know what happened to them? I like this part a little bit. They brought them four, and God sent out a plague. Boom, ten men dropped dead. They were leaders of the people, and Moses was a true leader, and those leaders were evil leaders, and God took care of them. And then the people were like, oh, no. We messed up. You know what we're going to do? We're going to go up into the land. We're going to do what we said we could do. We're going to believe God now. We can still go, right? And Moses said, it's over. You can't go up. The opportunity is gone. You've refused to believe. And you've refused to go. And they said, no, but we're going to do it. And the Amalekites came out of the mountain, and they chased them, and the men died. And they were killed in battle, and they chased them for miles across the land, all the way back, even unto Horma. Let's go back to our passage in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 1. Look at verse 29. So we get to the end of the story. This is a sad story of God trying to bring the people into the land, but they refused to believe. They trusted to their fears. This is what Moses said in verse 29. Then I said unto you, dread not. Neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you. I'm sorry. He shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. That's what their name, the people of Israel, means. Israel, God fights. And yes, they fight with God, but God fights for them. And it says, you're the people God fights for. I told you you could go up into the land. And everything that God did in Egypt, he's going to do here. And in the wilderness, where thou hast seen how the Lord thy God bare thee, as a man doth bear his son in the way that ye went, until ye came into this place. Yet in this thing ye did not believe the Lord your God. Remember, the pillar of the cloud and the pillar of the fire, who went in the way before you to search out a place to pitch your tents in fire by night to show you by what way you should go and in a cloud by day. God had been with them every day. And it's like God was their trail leader and he was that pillar of fire and all they had to do. And God searched out a place and he said, here's where I want you to be. And all the things that God did in Egypt and all the things that God did on the way, he said, yes, this is a dangerous place. And yes, the people are strong. And yes, it's going to be difficult. But I'm going to give it to you little by little. And all you have to do is believe. And yet they believed not. They didn't believe that they could go in. And they suffered for it. God wasn't trying to destroy them. God was trying to be merciful to them. And yet they chose the consequences of their own actions. The people of Israel had to choose to believe their fears or the God that had brought them out of Egypt. The life of faith is a life of choosing between your fears, the reality you live in, is choosing between your fears and the promises of God. And if you're going to live a life of faith, you have to choose between what you see between what you see and what God says. You have to make that choice. The people of Israel chose to believe what they saw and to believe the evil report, and they refused to believe God, and their rejection of God condemned them to doom. And every day as we live the life of faith and we follow God, you have to choose between what you see and what God says. And those are two different lives, 
two different paths, and it's up to us to choose and to remind us. And we shouldn't say, I know I want to be like Caleb, and I want to run through that crowd, and I want to shake people by their robes and say, hey, we can do it. But I know that far too often in my life, I'm disbelieving, and I look at the obstacles, and I say, Whoa, the mountain is big, and those people are so strong, and this, this thing that we're trying to do is so difficult, they're like superhuman people there. We're not going to go fight Captain America. He's going to beat us. There's no way. And, and they have walls, and we're like grasshoppers. That's who I am inside. But we need to believe what God tells us and that he has our good. And God promised to Abraham, and even though these people rebelled, God's promises would still come true. He would bring about the blessing, and we're proof today that he has. Let's choose, rather than what we see, what God says. Let's pray today. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We're so thankful for you. Help us to have faith to walk in your ways. Amen. All right, just a couple minutes before the morning service.
650 redeemed how I love to proclaim it redeemed by the blood of the lamb now you're going to have to help this morning and sing remember we're singing to the Lord how many of you glad you're saved today could you say amen how many of you glad that the Supreme Court got abortion right could you say amen how many of you glad that we have a beautiful day to serve the Lord in a church and a building to meet in. And let's sing of our redemption. Like we really mean it. Amen. Here we go. Reading how I love to proclaim it.
we come before you in prayer this morning. And Lord, we ask that you would encourage our hearts in your word and in the truth that's in your word. And that you would give us understanding of how we ought to order our lives in these last days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's turn to 398. <clears throat> Everything changes but Jesus. Amen. 300. sweet it is just to trust in Jesus. Let's sing that song 392.
And just before the message, we're going to have Esther bring us a special in song, a new song. Listen very close. Beautiful, haunting melody with great words. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 2. We'll get there in a few minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, how many of you are aware of the momentous decisions that have come down from the Supreme Court uh, this week? And... Uh,
I'd like to give just a little bit of a review of American history, if I would, before we get into our text. Uh, I have stood in this pulpit on more than one occasion over the last two and a half years expressing uh, uh, distrust and shock at decisions and edicts passed down for, uh, from our government and trying to uh, remind you that the Bible is still true, that God is still on his throne. Uh, I don't know if you'll remember, but two years ago, July 4th, after our uh, governor's Don't Thank God, Thank Me press meeting, uh, I talked about politicians who wanted to be gods, and uh, that worked out so well for our former governor, and, and I am appreciative of his demise. I'm not going to apologize for that in the least, uh, but I will tell you this the one that followed in his footsteps, she actually believes the garbage that he peddled for personal gain. And we need to be in prayer. The primary is Tuesday. If you are a citizen, uh, you should be voting. If you have any questions, see me. Uh, I'd be happy to give whatever information that I can gain and uh, that we might put an end to some of this foolishness. But today, I would like to say something. The government got it right. And, and when they do, I think we ought to be honest and, and admit that and give notice. And that brings the history lesson. Because once again, as a nation, we find ourselves at a critical crossroads. I would like to bring for your, to your mind four other occasions in history when through the prayers and sacrifice and sometimes as the first time I will mention even taking up of arms, a great and terrible evil in American society was supposedly put to rest. The first time that I would like to bring before you is April of 1865. The building at Union Baptist Church was barely two years old. Our country was mourning the death of our president, Abraham Lincoln, and celebrating the end of the Civil War. A war that was fought regardless of what your uh, uh, political sophistry happens to bring to mind a, the war was fought over the issue of slavery and decided once and for all that the evil of chattel slavery would be abolished. That was a great day. That was a good thing. But here's what happened. Is the Christians and the churches who had prayed and sacrificed and sent men, and many of them had fought in the battles of the great civil war. Having achieved that victory and putting, to, uh, putting in the grave slavery, thought that somehow salvation had come to these United States and that it was the church's job to usher in an age of sinless perfection where Jesus would come and take the throne. Actually, that was the rise of what we call post-millennialism. By the time we get to the 1920s, those same churches that had lauded the end of slavery as the second coming were throwing their Bibles away we're believing the miracles of the Bible were only stories, that Jesus was nothing but just another person. You see, just because slavery died, the devil didn't. And when people falsely chose, I'm talking about Christians, I'm talking about churches, uh, the issue of slavery was fought as much in the pulpit of this, the pulpits of this country as it was on the battlefield. And by the way, I go on record as having no respect for the Christianity of men like 
uh, General Lee and Stonewall Jackson, who claimed to be believers in the Bible but fought for the cause of slavery, there, there is no excuse and there is no reason that can be given to fight for something as abhorrent and evil as slavery was. And it was. It was put to rest in April of 1865. Or was it? We'll come back. Let's go forward in time to another crossroads, a pivotal time when a great societal evil was buried, was put to death. One of the devil's greatest tools has always been alcohol. It's a deadly poison. One little glass, half a bottle of this, if, if you filled this little water bottle with pure alcohol and drank it, you'd be dead unless you've spent years building up a tolerance to it. It's a deadly poison. In October 28, 1919, the United States Senate overrode a presidential veto by Woodrow Wilson, who claimed to be a Christian, and made the sale, manufacture, sale, purchase of alcoholic beverage over 1% uh, content in these United States illegal. It was a great day. There was rejoicing all throughout this nation. People were praising God for the great victory over alcohol. Twelve years later, the Volstead Acts went into uh, effect in January of, of 1920. Twelve years later, in 1932, a troubled nation which had not done anything to enforce the Volstead Acts, uh, allowing lawlessness in New York City was the place of 10,000 speakeasies, every one of them, and they all claim that they were serving homemade stuff. I want to tell you, Joe Kennedy and his buddies were smuggling in the finest liquor that Europe had to offer and we're selling it at a premium right here on these streets. And many people who before prohibition came in and alcohol was outlawed would never take a drink decided since it was against the law, maybe they would. That was the nature of our society. And President Hoover took a troubled and disillusioned nation and ordered a presidential board of inquiry. And by the time he came up for re-election, he lost to Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the liquor crowd, whose first act was to repeal in 1932 the very victory that had been won and purchased over 50 years of labor in 1919. Could I tell you the third time that this country stood at a crossroads claiming to have buried a great and terrible evil was in May and August of 1945 when the twins, demonic twins of Nazism and fascism were finally brought under and subdued. It was a time of rejoicing in the streets. Uh, there was hardly a family in this nation that did not have someone who had served uh, in uh, World War II and many, many people knew those that had given their lives. But Hitler was dead. The high-ranking generals of Japan were put to death. The emperor was now, had publicly humbled himself in the presence 
of the Japanese people on the radio and addressed for the first time the Japanese people heard the voice of their president and he said the Americans have won and we surrender. It was a glorious day. There should be rejoicing on such a day. I'd like to bring a fourth one. Some of you might remember this. On November 9th, 1989, after an impassioned speech by then former President Ronald Reagan, they began to tear down the Berlin Wall. And the great specter of communism of the Soviet Iron Curtain was brought down and people said it was over. And I want to tell you, there was, re how many of you remember that day? Somebody got me a little piece of the Berlin Wall. I have it in my desk and, and I'm keeping it there, sealed in plastic, because most of it was asbestos, by the way. Um, a very fitting, uh, deadly chemical to build a very deadly wall. Uh, but I want to tell you something. At each moment we, I have mentioned this morning, the Christians of this nation rejoiced. The devil had been proclaimed to be defeated. Victory was declared. And I'd like to tell you that there are more people involved in slavery today in these United States than were before the Civil War began. If you take the slavery of human, tra human trafficking added to the slavery of those involved in the manufacture and distributing of the drugs, added to those uh, the industrial slavery and the indentured servitude of many of the immigrants that come to this country, I want to tell you slavery is not dead, nor has it ever been dead because the devil was not killed on that day. And because the Christians declared victory and went about their merry ways, I'd like to challenge you today that slavery has a greater influence and hold on our society today than it did in April of 1861 when the first shots were fired at the Civil War. How about alcohol? Alcohol is no longer considered a vice, it's a virtue. Oh, you're only a drunk? Count your blessings. You could be so much worse off. Isn't that the attitude of this day? How, what percentage of this population of our United States is on mind-altering drugs, whether prescribed or unprescribed, they just arrested a person with enough fentanyl to murder 12 million people and the maximum prison sentence he will face is six years. Unfortunately, it's under the jurisdiction of one of those uh, George Soros kind of DAs and he'd probably get off with time served. How does that happen? I'll tell you how it happens. It happens when Christians take their eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth that's in his word and think they've won a battle that is still fighting, that is still going on. The devil never quits, my friend. How about Nazism and fascism? Are they dead? One of the greatest political problems dealing in Germany and social problems is neo-Nazism. Do not look it up on the web, please. Do not investigate this. But how about I offer Antifa, BLM, MS-13, Hell's Angels, The Proud Boys, 
and a host of 3,300 other gangs running rampant all over this nation whose only job is to enforce their ideas. Oh, wait a minute, the Proud Boys, they're good people. They're a gang. It is the same thought process and the same mentality of Nazism and fascism. How many of you work in a place where you cannot even speak openly of what you believe because you will be persecuted by your employer, possibly losing your job, you will be shunned by other employees, simply because you want to voice an opinion that is contrary to theirs. Hey, let's be honest, it is everywhere. Fascism is not dead, it's just got different names. Nazism is not dead because Adolf Hitler is dead. It just has new leaders. And what I remind you today, that the greater percentage of the congressional delegation from New York State espouses and publicly identifies as practicing communist. Communism is dead in the former Soviet Union, but it's alive and well here in these United States. You see, that's not a very uh, encouraging, well, we're, we're getting a history lesson here. You see, as of Friday morning, June 24th, 4th, 2022, the Supreme Court ruled that the jurisprudence that gave the right to abortion no longer exists. I want you to understand what they did is far greater than any nightmare that the left could imagine in overturning not only Roe versus Wade, but Planned Parenthood versus Casey, they removed all legal precedent and standing for the right of abortion in America jurisprudence. It was a sweeping and complete decision, and we should rejoice. According to the Guttmacher Institute, since Roe v. Wade was decided and inserted by Judici the judiciary into the American legislature, meaning the judges made law instead of passed a judiciary verdict, 63,459,781 babies were purposive, purposefully medically killed under the right of abortion. That makes Adolf Hitler look like a sissy. Joe Stalin is a kindergartner. Pol Pot didn't even come close. He doesn't even get a starting position in this race. I want to tell you something. The Supreme Court got it right. That's good. And we ought to be thankful for it. But the devil ain't dead. President Trump is not our savior. And the Supreme Court justices are not angelic beings. In fact, I don't know any of those people involved that give a solid biblical testimony of possessing Bible salvation as what the Bible says. But I still rejoice in what happened, and you should as well. We should be thankful. We should praise God for allowing this to happen. And we stand at a crossroads. I don't know how many, it was Franklin Graham sent a message to pre, former President Trump saying, because of your work, you've answered the prayer of millions of people. I want to tell you something, President Trump does not answer our prayers. 
And I'm sure that that's not what he intended to say. It may have just been the way it was written in the article, uh, or it could be the way I remember the article, having read it just two or three times to make sure that I got it close to right. But the overturning of abortion is the answer to millions of people's prayers. Could we say amen to that? And if you want to put the, uh, the uh, credit where credit is due, Mr. Trump gets credit. He did it. Without him, this would never have been possible. But I want us to stop this morning and understand a few things about the world in which we live and our duty and our place as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at three different passages of Scripture, each one illustrating a point. If Brother Sam were here, he would say this is a textual or topical expository sermon because we're going to look at several different passages and get the basic truth there that will help us put together an understanding of what's going on around us and why these great victories really weren't great victories. Why the ground was re-given with vigor that the devil, when he retook it, did so in a spectacular fashion. And so Romans chapter 2, now the overall passage here is part of the first three chapters as Paul is condemning the Jewish believers at the church of Rome for their false notion that because they were Jewish that they had a greater understanding and a greater knowledge of God's word. Now, I, I want you to, we've went over this many times as we've gone through the book of Acts in our Sunday school time. The first pastors of the first churches were almost entirely, exclusively Jewish people because they were the only people in the world who had spent their life studying the Word of God. And when they got the identity of the Messiah, who is Jesus Christ our Lord, they were ready-made preachers. But as Paul moved out of the Jewish community, as the Jewish community began expelling those who believed in Jesus and claiming they were non-Jews, then we had to have a period where it took more training and more time. And that's why Paul was in the city of Ephesus over three years, the city of Corinth, almost two, and starting these churches because it took more time to help them understand the Word of God. That's why we have two books to the church at Corinth. And we're going through some of that misunderstanding on our study Thursday night. And so as Paul is condemning here the Jewish believers, he is making a statement about what goes on in the world around us. And this is, we're just going to kind of pluck this thought out of the overall context here, starting in verse 14. Romans chapter 2, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Now let's just stop there. The Gentiles have been known, unsaved people, people without biblical training, have been known on occasion to get something right, to actually agree with the Word of God. Does that mean they are saved? No. Does that mean they are right? Absolutely. When you agree with the Bible, you are right. So the first point I would like to bring out is that when the unsaved agree with the Word of God, the best that the unsaved world can do, the best that our founding fathers, when they built this country and started it, was to say amen to what was already in the Word of God. 
You see, the men who wrote the, con the uh, Declaration of Independence did not want, had no desire for King George to grant them rights. You see, this is one of the reasons the abortion lovers are so upset today. They forgot something. A very simple truth that our founding fathers knew quite well. If government does it, they can undo it. Hello? If government does it, government can undo it. They were rejoicing. I remember the party screaming, uh, Roe versus Wade, when it came in, a as a young man, did not understand all about abortion. I think I was in elementary school at the time. But I knew there were an awful lot of people very happy about something that my preacher said was very evil. And now they're all upset. If you have any questions... Do not listen to your podcast. Don't listen, read the newspapers or the news articles. Go to the Supreme Court site, download their decision, and read what Justice Thomas says. Read it. You won't believe what you're reading. You're going to say, how in the world did this become law in these United States? There is no reasoning whatsoever. Our youngest child that is able to speak has better thought processes than the lawyers who argued for Roe versus Wade. Just Thomas, Justice Thomas states not quite that way, not to demean people, but uh, that's the gist of it. It's nonsense. What the government did, it can undo. The best our country, I want you to understand, those Supreme Court justices, most of them are Roman Catholic. If they believe in the faith of Roman Catholicism, then they exclude themselves from the salvation that is taught in this book called the Bible. Are we together on that? Uh, I've read and listened to our president, uh, former President Trump, and though he has done a lot of great things and he has played the part of a Christian a whole lot better than former presidents who gave testimony to faith in Christ. If I were a picking man, I'd take Trump's faith over Bush's faith twice every day of the week. But from what I understand from George Bush Jr., we will see him on the right side of eternity. I wish I had that confidence about Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump, but we do not. I wish I had that confidence about Obama and Mr. Biden and Nancy Pelosi, but I have no hope of them ever trusting in the truth of this book called the Bible. But I'm still going to pray for him. How about you? What I'm trying to say is, Paul said, even the Gentiles do by nature prove that God's law is good and best and that God's law is written in our hearts and that any honest person that will look in the mirror has to know that abortion is wicked and evil. Even Senator Patrick Moynihan of, uh, of, these New, York, of New York fame, uh, ultra-liberal, said this partial birth abortion is infanticide. He was by no means pro-life, but he could not abide the diatribe and the practice of the abortion providers in this state. And by the way, partial birth abortion is still legal in New York State. That didn't change. Let's read verse 15. 
which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. We just covered this, this next part I love. And their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Oh, talk about the Bible giving a absolutely succinct summary of what's going on in politics today. What are our politicians doing? Accusing or excusing each other. Isn't that true? I mean, that's what we got going on here. And, and I want to tell you, they're not all wrong about everything. We we'll read verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. I want to tell you, just because the Supreme Court passed judgment on abortion, the issue has not been settled because the supreme justice of this universe has yet to speak. He, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will judge every man, the saved unto eternal life, the wicked and rebellious unto eternal damnation. So I want us to start with a proper understanding. Please do not take what I'm saying and be sad about the Supreme Court decision. You should be glad. You should thank God. You should rejoice. Do not go to the parade, parades and go na 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 na. Please, that is not the attitude of Christ, and. That is not, that will only help their cause. Are we together on that? But understand that even at the best, all these people have done is said amen to what's already written in the Word of God. And that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. And to learn about what we should do, we need to study the life of one Ahab. So what, what's Ahab going to teach me? Well, I hope he'll put this thing and wrap it up here in the next hour or three. No, I won't be that long, I promise. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20. Now here's the story. Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, king in Damascus, gets his armies together and he comes down and he's going to wipe out the northern 12 tribes of Israel. Their king is Ahab. And we get down here to verse 13. And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thy hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the providences. Then he said, Who shall order the battle? And he answered, Thou. So, if you read the discourse that went between Ahab and the king of Assyria, finally they get down to the day of battle. Ben-Hadad and his kings that are with him have their army arrayed. They outnumber Israel uh, by a very, very incredible factor. I would like you to understand that both participants in this situation were not serving God. The king of Syria was evil. How about Ahab? Does he qualify as evil? Absolutely, 100%. You see, God is still interested in one thing. Did you catch that in verse 13? And thou shalt know that I am God. Now let's get the rest of the story here. 
skim, we're going to skip through. You can read the rest of it here. Uh, verse 20. And they slew everyone as man, and the Syrians fled, and Israel pursued them. And Benadad, king of Syria, escaped on a horse with the horsemen. And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. Victory! Verse 22. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go strengthen thyself and mark and see what thou doest, for at the return of the year the king of Syria will come up against thee. And then it goes on to tell uh, how that the Syrians said their gods are gods of the hills, but they're not gods of the valley. And so we'll fight them in the valley and we'll redo this thing and we'll win. And we get down to verse 28. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thy hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And then they prosecuted the battle. Ahab won, and you can read, and Ahab even messed that up. But I want you to understand something here. God is interested in showing himself as God. Could we say amen to that? What we saw here today, I mean on Friday morning, was just a little peeling away of the clouds, of the murkiness, of the evil and degradation of our society. And God got the victory over the issue of abortion at this point. And you need to listen to the dialogue that's going on. And if you want to pray about something, pray that these foaming at the mouth liberals who are screaming and benoming and wearing coat hangers and par parading around and trying to set fire to the uh, uh, different uh, abortion, uh, uh, pro-life clinics and uh, the group that tried to sequester the Arizona congressman while they were meeting in their House and Senate. Uh, there's a lot of violence going on. And they're saying all kinds of crazy things. California's passed a law that, uh, or Colorado, that you can take up to several months after the baby is born to kill it and still call it abortion. Now here's what's going to happen. These laws are going to have to go back before this same Supreme Court. And if these God-hating abortionist freaks will keep talking and keep doing what's in their heart and their mind, there will soon be no right to abortion anywhere in these United States because their own proclamations are so ridiculous. How can you expand on what is legal in New York without committing outright murder? And yet, our governor wants to expand on it. You need to pray that foolishness has its way just like we prayed two summers ago after our governor had the don't thank God, thank me press conference. How many of you remember that? Didn't that work out so well? I mean, how many of you are glad that Andrew Como is now a byword? But I want to tell you, Miss Hochul's worse than he is because she actually believes this stuff. She thinks it's real. I don't know how you get that foolish, but Years of education and being around Andrew Como can have that effect on people, I guess. It's bad. We need to pray. But we need to understand something. Abortion is not the battle. The battle is for souls. 
The best the world can do is say amen to God's word. They can't explain it. They can't tell somebody how to get saved. As we look at this thing here, this is between Ahab, the wickedest king in Israel, and the Syrians. Everybody's a loser in this conflict. And yet God steps in and gives Ahab the victory so that any honest person can read this story and look and still see that God is God. Can we say amen to that? And can we understand the battle is not over. We're not even fighting that battle. The battle we are fighting is to help people understand who God is and how he saves souls. Can we say amen to that? One more quick story here. Let's go to chapter 21. Down to verse 17. Now here's the story. After the defeat of the Syrians, things went relatively well in the land of Israel. Under Ahab, there was some peace and a little prosperity. And Ahab was doing so well, he needed to expand his food growing capabilities. And he spied the vineyard of Naboth right next to his palace and desired to take that vineyard and turn it into a garden of herbs. Uh, this would be vineyard, highest uh, arc, um, agricultural pursuit known in Israel, to a garden of herbs, the lowest. And besides, it was the wicked, filthy Ahab that wanted to do it. And Naboth said, I'm not going to give my inheritance that God has given me to you. Naboth was a righteous man. He paid for his righteousness with his life. Jezebel had him murdered. Ahab takes possession and dispossesses Naboth's family. And God sends in old Elisha. Calls him out of retirement. And Elisha shows up. And Ahab's, not you again. And the word of the Lord came to Elisha the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And so Elijah shows up, and he pronounces grievous and terrible judgments. He says, Ahab, your entire family is going to be wiped out. Nobody's going to be left. One generation from now, there will be no descendants of Ahab alive. And the dogs are going to eat your wife, who was the queen in the street, as if she were refuge. And the dogs are going to lick your blood in the streets, as if nobody cared that you were king. Wow. But let's skip down to verse uh, 27. And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring this evil in his days, but in his son's days, will I bring the evil upon his house. How many of you understand this story? Ahab was given what we would call respite. The judgment of God that was pronounced against him in his house would not fall until after he had died. Is Ahab in hell today? Yes. The fire's still hot. He is suffering as much today as he did those, oh, 2,500, 2,800 years ago when he showed up there. Hell is real. Hell is forever. And Ahab is in it without a doubt, without a question. Thought he could get around the prophecy of God, thought he could trick 
the Syrians into killing Hezekiah rather than killing Ahab. And the Bible says that a soldier drew his bow at a venture. He just closed his eyes and went, Phoing. And one of God's angels caught a hold of that arrow and brought it right down into the joint of his harness and had it pointing right in the right direction so that it would sever a major artery and Ahab would remain live long enough to see the battle through. And as the sun went down, Ahab died in a pool of blood in his own chariot. Why do I bring this up? Because I want to tell you that when the world does right, they say amen to the word of God. That God can use even wicked worldlings to prove that he still is God and he still is active. And that when wicked worldlings will humble themselves in the presence of almighty God, that God will give respite to the judgment that is pronounced against them. This happened again in the days of Josiah. How many of you are familiar with that story? How that Josiah got the uh, scriptures and he turned back to God and Josiah was delivered in his people and yet Josiah died an early death because he chose to fight Pharaoh and his sons were all wicked and brought God's judgment. God's judgment was still coming on Jerusalem because of the sins of Manasseh. And I want to tell you, God's judgment is still coming. He is not going to ignore the murder of 63,459,781. And I seriously doubt the accuracy of that number. In truth, could easily be 20, 25% higher, closer to 80 million, I think would be a more fair number of the innocent lives taken by people who lied, cheated, and profited from the murder of the most innocent among us. The fact that they have been stripped of that power in the 16 states completely as of today, I am a happy man. The fact that there's another good number, at least 10 more states that are going to do the same thing in the next few weeks, I am even a more happy man. The fact that these foolish people are raving at the mouth and even on quoting as we love murdering little babies with, laced with profanity. It's in the news. It's out there. That can only turn against them and be used against them by any thinking person in this society. But I'm here to tell you that abortion, just like communism, just like Nazism and fascism, just like alcohol and just like slavery is not the issue. Rejoice. But if you want to stop abortion, we need to get into the hearts of these young children who are told to throw away their most precious possession, their virginity, for the sake of personal pleasure and experimentation. We've got to put a stop to the wicked, evil people. And the word groomer is a good word because that's what they're doing. You don't do that on the spur of a moment. You don't lose and throw away all of those things with just one perchance event. Rapists do not go out and harm little ones on their first thought. There's, there's a huge process that goes on to degradate the soul and the minds. You have to be trained and prepared for this great wickedness. And that's what the public school system is all about today. 
But if they'll get saved, God can solve that problem. See, 1 Kings chapter 18, how many of you remember the story of Mount Carmel? Isn't that cool story? Here's what Elijah did as the sun was setting. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart again. And the fire of God fell and burnt up the sacrifice and the altar, the stones and the dirt and evaporated all the water that was around it. There was nothing but a hole. And the people said, the Lord, that guy's God is the real one. And they killed the prophets of Baal. Well, by the time we get to chapter 20, they got all the prophets of Baal again. Jezebel's going full blast. She's able to manipulate the murder of Naboth. The whole thing is just going in the same direction it was before. We must be serious about the trust that God's left us. God is not sending fire down to offer the sacrifice and to give a physical testimony to what, like he did in the days of Elijah. You want me to tell you why? Because we got this book right here. That's why we don't need that to happen again. It's already happened. If you won't believe what's in here, you're not going to believe it even if the miracles were recreated, number one. Number two, it's not going to happen because that's not God's plan. He gave us a church. That's God's plan. We need to be busy about the work of souls. I want to ask a question here today. When is the last time you witnessed to somebody about getting saved? Not pastor, not pastor's wife. When's the last time you talked to somebody about their need of salvation? Could I challenge you today? It's been too long. Is there anybody going to say, oh, no, not me. I'm not. My hand's not up because it, I need to do, be better at this. I need to do it more. So do you. You see, there's a great victory and we should rejoice. Do not be sad. Praise the Lord. If you have not gotten on your knees and thank God for the Supreme Court decision, I would challenge you in a few minutes at the invitation time that you would avail yourself of that opportunity. It is the response of every person who believes this book, and it ought to be. Amen? But more importantly, much more important, all the Supreme Court did was say amen to what's in the Bible already. That's all they can do. God used some people that were not saved to win a great victory for which we can thank God for. Ahab and the Syrians. Amen? Are you with me on this? And their humility, Ahab's humility at God's rebuke, gave Israel a little more time and may give you and I, as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ through his church, a little more time to send another missionary, to witness to somebody about their eternal state, to give the gospel again to someone who will listen. We've been through this many times, and maybe we need to do it again on Sunday nights, just go through how to witness again. I don't think that would hurt us. Maybe we'll just do that tonight. Spur of the moment decision. Let's, let's take our next several Sunday nights and spend 
on how to tell somebody about Jesus. And one of the first things we're going to cover is if they don't want to listen, go find somebody that does. Amen? You're not going to run out of people to say no in New York City. Are we together? But that's the real battle. The devil's not dead. People are still dying and going to hell every day on both sides of the issue. Now, some people are not going to listen. Sometimes I give tracts to people whom I know are going to refuse it. You know why? Because when I get to heaven and they're standing in God's docket, they're going to say, nobody told me. God's going to rewind the tape. Remember that crazy preacher you cussed at and told him he was stupid? Hey, that's me. <laughs> you see, he was there to tell you about me and you wouldn't listen. I want us to understand something. The battle never has been to make a righteous nation out of these United States. The battle is, is God's people serving him in his church? And by the way, I think I've preached enough about that, that that is a very narrow definition. Are they going to be responsible with what God has given us? Are you going to tell somebody about Jesus this week? Uh, I don't know where to start. We'll make a way. We'll figure it out. We'll send somebody with you. If you have somebody who will listen, you call me. I'll come over. I may still have my work clothes on, but I don't care. If they don't care, I'll give them the gospel. Amen? That's the battle. Praise God for the Supreme Court decision. They got it right. By the way, they got about six or eight other things wrong, but they got that one right. Amen. Be happy. Don't tease the world. The devil is very vicious. Be like the guy playing with the lion at the zoo. Lost his arm right about here. Where was it? In the lion. Don't play with the lion. Go tell somebody about Jesus. Help a missionary get to the field. Be faithful in your church attendance. Be faithful with what is in this book. Don't sit here righteous at church and go home and do wicked things. Hey, that's the battle. All God's people said, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for the responsibility that you have given us. You're not going to send the fire. You're not going to put the gospel in the stars. You want to put it in our hearts so that we can tell others about it. We ask, Lord, that each one of us would be serious. And that we'd be willing to tell somebody about Jesus this week. Lord, I think that's a prayer that you would answer. I know it is. And Lord, that we would take our eyes off the ancillary issues of this world and put them on the battle for souls. The battle to be faithful to your word in your church. The battle of personal holiness. 
Lord, that we would engage the enemy on every front, understanding that more often than not, the enemy that hinders us the most is not the devil or the world, but our own souls. Work in each heart here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. The hymn of invitation is one that we know just as I am. We're not going to sing the words today. But would you step out? Would you take a few moments and pray at an old-fashioned altar? Would you ask God to give you somebody that you could tell about Jesus this week? Won't be long. Nobody comes. We'll dismiss the service. But would you come? Could we get some men that would come? We'll delay the offering. It doesn't have to happen right now. We need to get serious. today and you're not saved, would you let Jesus save you? If you're saved, why wouldn't you want to identify him through baptism and church membership? But we can't do that unless you ask us, unless you tell us. You get saved, then you get baptized. And you can begin serving God through his church. That's his plan, the only one. I tell you, the protesters are very serious. We ought to pray for protection of our church and of ourselves. But the greatest protection is just being obedient to God. people said amen you may be seated if we could have our men come at this time let's continue our worship through our giving you ask God to bless the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this offering, Lord. We pray that you take it and you would use it to your honor and your glory. You'd be with us as we go out into the world that we would share your gospel to all those that we meet, that you'd be honored and glorified. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I'm pretty sure Stephen gave you all vital statistics during Sunday school. Uh, probably even snuck a picture in the slide presentation knowing Stephen. Uh, I did not know that, but I'm getting some yeses. I, I figured that one out. So anyway, praise the Lord uh, for the safe and healthy delivery of little Evangeline. And uh, do want you to pray for Shirley Lim. Uh, yesterday morning, she was rushed to the ER, had emergency surgery, 
Uh, without giving you all the details, it just happened to deal with some type of uh, uh, intestinal strangulation. The surgery was successful. She's actually sitting up. Uh, George, Brother George texted me actually during the Sunday school time. Got to see her this morning. Uh, but there is a, a, a fairly long and painful road to recovery. And so if you could praise the Lord for keeping Miss Shirley safe, Miss Shirley Lim, and uh, pray that uh, healing would come there. Uh, our next uh, scheduled events. We're going to have the Glory Bound Quartet with us this year. It's been quite a little while since we've had uh, Glory Bound and uh, looking forward to that. Uh, I think we're going to get them over to uh, Union Saturday afternoon and just put them out on the front steps and, and have them sing right out in the neighborhood there and, and uh, hopefully that'll uh, uh, draw a little bit of attention. Uh, bike rides coming up. Our ladies' Bible study is July 15th. And our next family fun night is July 22nd. So please put that on the uh, calendar there. And uh, please keep the work at Union in Prayer. It's been a very difficult week uh, just trying to make sure the right wire is hooked to the right wire to the right wire, which hooks to the right wire. Amen. And if that sounds confusing, it is. Uh, extremely so, and uh, uh, just uh, pray that uh, able to get a handle on that thing, and my wife says, every time you say you're almost done, then you give me a whole new list of things, and uh, yeah, that's all the parts of the only thing that's left, amen? No, uh, just, just pray we can put that thing to rest this week, if you would. Uh, that would be a great encouragement to my wife. Um, and uh, me too. So uh, let's keep all that in prayer and let's uh, be faithful. And I'm, I'm serious. Would you pray that God would give you somebody to witness to this week? Would you pray about that? And so let's stand together. 51, if you need those words as we're dismissed. She's